in a normal tandem, you don't have to advise them of anything because it's an experience, right? So just have your experience. If you're scared, feel your fear. You know, that's kind of the point of this, right? You're not going skydiving because it's like, you know, stamp collecting or, or playing chess, right? You're doing something that's supposed to be exciting. And it looks like she's having something exciting. What's up, GQ? I'm Jeb Corliss. I'm a professional skydiver and base jumper, and this is The Breakdown. First up, Mission Impossible Fallout. What I really love about this particular shot is that this was all shot in like one sequence. So they want to show that it's actually Tom Cruise who's the one doing the jump and it's not a stunt guy because that's like super important for them during this scene. I remember my buddy, his name's Craig O'Brien, he's the cameraman who's actually filming this scene. So they specifically built that helmet with that like visor with an oxygen system in it because they're actually leaving from 25,000 feet so he needs air. And they put lights in it so you can see that it's actually Tom Cruise leaving the aircraft himself, which is a really big deal. This was actually incredibly difficult to film because they're changing focal points. I mean, that, that, this is impressive. This is no green screen. This is, this is all done for real, which for me, I think is, it makes it more special. It makes it more interesting. Altitude, 25,000 feet. You need to have supplemental oxygen inside of an aircraft when you're skydiving above 16,500 feet. That's where they start sticking stuff in their nose and they're, you, you only need it inside the aircraft at that point when you start breathing. Then they can take it out and jump out of the aircraft. At 25,000 feet, you need to have full oxygen system, full air the entire time or you will pass out, like you'll go unconscious. When you're gonna do a skydive and you're gonna open up and it's gonna be unpressurized, you have to have solid like breathing the entire time. And what they'll normally do is even beyond that, just to make sure a person's body is extra saturated with oxygen, they'll put them on pure oxygen on the ground for like an hour to like two hours before they go up to do the actual stunt. If they become hypoxic and you're doing a skydive, that can equal some very dangerous situations. So Tom Cruise had to go through an enormous amount of training and do a lot of prep before getting to this point. It's one of the most technically demanding scenes I've ever seen an actor actually do. This whole scene is very real, and this is where they start adding in kind of movie, like Hollywood stuff. Like there's a cloud, and they're like, you know, a storm that they're flying into, and there's lightning like striking and stuff. This is obviously CGI, but they're actually really genuinely in a, like a skydive at high altitude, and then they add all these components in. You don't jump through. <laughs> through lightning clouds because the chances of like lightning striking and, and damaging you and killing you is high. So they create a realistic scenario. Come on. This whole scene of them, him catching him and him being unconscious and him trying to like, you know, work with him and wake him up. They did all this for real. They actually built a giant wind tunnel on the studio lot. And they spent hours training this sequence in a wind tunnel so they could do it in the sky for real. Altitude, 10,000 feet. 9,000. And the timing between when they're saying the altitudes seems to be pretty accurate. There actually is an altimeter that does call out your altitudes now. It, it tells you when you're at like, you know, 12,000 feet, then it'll say 11,000. And then as you get even lower, it starts counting it out even, even more. Even his visor is fogged up. So if you don't have an oxygen flow running, the visor actually gets fogged. So it's actually the fact that they're so detail oriented that they've even fogged his visor. I mean, it's, that's impressive. Let's, let's keep going. 8,000. In real life, the concept of switching oxygen um, in the air would be physically impossible because oxygen systems don't work that way. They created an oxygen system to make that concept work. In real life, the oxygen bottles are attached to you and it's, that's a little trickier to accomplish, but how they've set it up 
the way they put the story together, the way they have their equipment designed. It's all possible based in the, the system that they've structured. 4,000. Walker! Walker! 3,000. Deploy, 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 deploy. They're being so like critical with their accuracy. The fact that they are actually having Tom Cruise flip him over before deploying him is actually really interesting because yeah, he could have deployed him on his back, but it's more likely he'll get a malfunction. This Ethan Hunt character is so like, you know, perfection that he actually wants to flip him over to give him the best chance of having a good deployment, even when it's risking himself because they're so low. And the altitudes they're showing is looking very real. It's looking like that's right about where you would be when they're saying the altitude that they would be at. Deploy, 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 deploy. Where he deploys at the very last second, parachute inflates, catches, and puts in there. That's obviously done with CGI, but it's, it's incorporated really well and it's pretty accurate. I've actually had openings like that myself where I've deployed and instantly hit like a tree and hung. Under normal circumstances for a de-licensed skydiver, right now they're saying the altitude for safe deployments is around 3,000 feet. The reason why they say 3,000 feet is because that gives you time for if you have a malfunction to cut away your malfunction, get rid of the parachute that's not working properly and still have enough time to open a reserve, your secondary parachute. So in this scenario, you could probably go as low as 500 feet. But I would say in this, it's looking like he probably would have been deploying around anywhere between 300 to 500 feet, give or take, you know? And, and that's with specialty base jumping gear. You could do that with skydiving gear. It's a little trickier. So it took Tom Cruise about 250 skydives of training jumps to get that shot. And then over a six week period, they had a three minute window, one jump every evening in order to get the lighting at just the perfect kind of light to be able to do all that CG to put the clouds and the city underneath them. So it took over six weeks of one jump a night at that three minute little window in order to capture that scene. Incredible. That's an impressive scene. There's just no question. The filming, the execution, I, I wouldn't have any critique saying how they could do it better. That was about as good as you can do. Next up, point break. I remember when I saw this scene the first time, actually watching an actor step out of the aircraft themselves where you know it's the actor and not a stuntman was like a super huge deal at this time. And it, you know, everyone thought skydiving was super crazy dangerous. So seeing Patrick Swayze actually do that stunt, I remember it was like mind blowing. It, it really was. Which I think that was the whole point of him going out backwards was much more about showing you that Patrick Swayze was doing this for real. This scene is where things start getting very Hollywood and very unrealistic. So the concept is more psychological. He doesn't have a parachute. So if he doesn't catch him and get a grip on him, he's going to die. It's absolutely possible to catch up to someone. Um, if the character, as you can see, the Patrick Swayze character is falling belly to earth, and then they show the Keanu Reeves character kind of in almost a head down tracking position, he'll be going a lot faster than the guy falling belly to earth. So it has to do with how much you weigh and how much surface area you take up. So you can change speeds based on that. The time frame they're stretching this out for obviously cinematic purposes. This would have to have happened much faster than what they're showing here. A skydive typically lasts from 12,500 feet about 45 seconds. Maybe 50, 55 to 45 seconds, depending on what you're doing. And here, you can actually see the stuntman has a hidden rig underneath his shirt. So you can see that he's got a special shirt that will break off, open up, so he actually has a parachute underneath, because obviously they didn't do this for real. So this is this is where it starts getting really kind of hilarious because they're yelling at each other and talking in free fall, which without a full face helmet and aerial communication, if you have just your face out and you're like yelling at someone, no one's gonna hear you. You're doing over 120 miles an hour. If you ever stick your head out of a window of a moving car, like at 60 miles an hour, it's impossible to communicate like that. Pull the cord now! Now you pull it! Go ahead, Johnny, pull it! 
gotta drop the gun, right? What a lot of people don't realize is that when you've got two people hanging on to each other, um, that combined body weight and that small surface area generates an enormous amount of speed. So they'll start going so fast that even if he was holding on with all of his might and had his legs wrapped around him, if he deploys his parachute, he's just gonna get ripped out of his hands. It's, it's pretty much physically impossible to hold on to someone in this scenario. And I kind of know this from personal experience. I tried to do this with a buddy of mine and we held on to each other and we got to terminal velocity. And when I went to deploy, I mean, he just got ripped from my arms. There was a 0% chance I could hold on to him. A lot of people who see this are gonna be like, hey, but people have done this. Like people have jumped out of aircraft and grabbed onto other people and then they've opened and, and that has happened. I know of three different people. Travis Pastrana did it, a guy named Sean Palmer did it. But the way they do it is actually wear a harness and then that harness, they have another hook that hooks into the harness on the skydiving rig. That's the only way they can actually take the force of the deployment without it like ripping their arms and their fingers off. As long as you have an inflated canopy over your head, you'll hit, and sometimes you can hit kind of hard, but usually it'll be something like that. You're covered in dirt, and if you weren't injured before, there's a good chance you could walk that off. And the other guy who had a previous injury can't. So that's within reason. So that scene is one of those classic scenes that you know you see when you're young, and then you think, yeah, man, could that really be done? And the answer to the question is no, that that's not realistic in even the slightest sense. But I will say this, it's very entertaining to watch. Next up, San Andreas. In three minutes, we're gonna be over the Embarcadero. And? And we're gonna drop into at t Park. But I don't know how to parachute. That's okay, we're gonna tandem jump. So tandem skydiving is when you have a person who's got a large parachute with a harness, and then the second person, is going to wear another harness that hooks into the harness that the person with the parachute has. So it's a way for someone who's a novice, who doesn't know how to skydive or have any experience with skydiving, can then do a skydive with zero training. So that's where this is interesting, that they've actually used this concept to be able to take a novice out of an aircraft and make it somewhat plausible. Trust me. I find this kind of interesting. They're in an actual jump plane. Like that's a door that's specifically for skydiving. Like that's a very special door. And the only aircraft I've ever seen in the world that has a door like that is a skydiving aircraft because it's designed to be lifted up easily. It's designed so people can get out freely without hitting things and having obstructions. It's also interesting that this particular aircraft just happened to have a tandem rig with a tandem harness in it. And not too many aircraft are built like this and not too many aircraft would ever, and even a skydiving aircraft wouldn't have a tandem just in it. Ready? Twist down, ready? And whoever The Rock was like getting like training from did a really good job teaching him. Cause they, this is exactly how a tandem instructor would be talking, would be operating, would be doing and as far as like get, sitting out on the edge and then pushing out, that's normally how a tandem will exit because it makes it a little more comfortable, especially with a small door like this one. This is kind of a smaller door for a, a skydiving aircraft. I haven't done a tandem since I was very young, like that's 29 years ago. But because I fly wingsuits, I'm always with the tandem. So I'm watching tandems leave aircraft like every day. And it's fun to watch tandems leave because of the reaction of the people doing it for the first time. And yeah, lots of times they're screaming, they're crying, they're begging to stop. It's actually, I actually find watching tandems to be one of the most enjoyable experiences of my life because it's just so much fun watching people be terrified. I don't know, I'm, I'm a little sadistic like that, but I love watching tandems. They give me so, so much joy. In a normal tandem, you don't have to advise them of anything because it's an experience, right? So just have your experience. If you're scared, feel your fear. You know, that's kind of the point of this, right? You're not going skydiving because it's like, you know, stamp collecting or, or playing chess, right? You're doing something that's supposed to be exciting. And it looks like she's having something exciting. <laughs> You have to go through a very strict like regiment program to learn how to do this. And most tandem instructors have thousands of jumps. It's something where you, it takes a lot of time, a lot of dedication, and most people have to turn it into a career in order to really do it. Oh. 
So this is quite interesting because they're they're really doing this exactly how a tandem would would work. So what happens is they leave the aircraft. Once they're clear, they actually release something called a drogue chute, which is a small round parachute that's attached to the main rig and it holds you stable so that you don't fall too fast with two bodies connected to each other. So it slows you down and it stabilizes you. So the fact that they're actually using a drogue shows that they're pretty much doing this for real. When he grabs her arms and pulls them down, that's them trying to tell a story that they're trying to make movement, right? That's a track where they're trying to slide on air to move closer to the landing area that they're trying to get to. That would be effective if a person's by themselves. It's not really super effective when you're doing a tandem with two bodies and a drogue chute kind of keeping you stabilized. I, I think it's a pretty good scene. Now, there's a few obvious little Hollywood things, but other than that, the idea of using a tandem to get down to some place when everything's destroyed, that's a realistic concept if you had all that equipment in that exact scenario that they set up. Next up, Furious 7. Okay, here we go. That's okay. <laughs> They're launching a car out of an aircraft. It's interesting because I can already see like right off the bat something that's bizarre, which is the car came out of the aircraft and is now flying stable, which is very unrealistic with any kind of vehicle that gets out of an aircraft. If a vehicle doesn't have a, a drogue chute, like keeping it stabilized, it'll instantly start tumbling. Okay, so yeah, they're showing multiple cars coming out, all coming out perfectly stable. It's very unrealistic. There are times when you would drop Humvees, tanks, cars, whatever it is that you would drop them from an aircraft. Ordinarily, you'd do it from lower altitude. You would have them launched out on pallets that have round parachutes attached to them. So as they come out, the parachute instantly opens, which keeps everything stable. And they drop them in big open areas so that they can land wherever they land. Then once it hits, people come to them, get them off the pallet and drive them away. So the fact there's no pallets and you can't see a parachute of any kind anywhere, it's already incredibly unrealistic. Now isn't the time. I'm gonna stay up here with the pilot. We gonna circle around and make sure we holding it down from up here. You're running out of time. The chute is guided by GPS. <laughs> That's really funny. She's like, the chute is guided by GPS. <sighs> I, I, I've seen this, obviously, this movie, and I, they have round parachutes. Round parachutes you can't guide. They just go where the wind blows them. It's like, the chute's not guided by GPS, but okay. Hey man, listen, I'm sorry to let y'all down, okay? I'm gonna go ahead and stay up here. No, brother. I'm sorry to let you down. What? What are you doing? So I find that kind of interesting how they have a little drogue shoot to like pull him out because that's what all of them should have had from the very first to keep them stabilized. But what's interesting is it pulls him out and then as it gets out, it instantly releases sending him into a tumble, which it's funny that his vehicle, for some reason, isn't magical like the rest of theirs. It just flies perfectly. Somehow it's tumbling, but theirs weren't. I hate you, Dad! Get ready! Ground's coming fast! It's kind of interesting because they're showing that the ground's coming fast. They're all falling towards it. I don't understand why they didn't just open a parachute right away. I mean, why are you going in free fall in a car? It doesn't seem to make any sense, but I guess they're in a rush. But if they're in a rush, why would you launch so high? Why not just launch closer to the ground? It doesn't make any sense. You would use a round parachute pretty much for this situation, for dropping big payloads, like big cars, when they're bringing like, you know, parts of spaceships back to Earth, it's always round parachutes, right? Because they're they're very reliable and they can hold lots of weight. You can make them very large so they're scalable. So you can drop tanks with them, right? But the problem with a round parachute is there's no control over a round parachute. And the fact that they're all in formation, this defies physics, it defies reality. 
It, and, and I think that that's what I've seen with the Fast and the Furious movies. They kind of started out as like realistic movies where it's kind of based in the real world. And then as the numbers got higher, they're not even trying to be realistic. I find it funny and interesting, but if you're trying to say, is it real? Can this be done? Not like this. But honestly, I don't think the car would fall apart in the air. I think it would fall apart once it hit the ground. Next up, Point Break. This one I have a, a kind of a close connection to because I actually worked as technical advisor on this one. The director's concept was to make this as real as it could possibly be. Right now, these four wingsuit pilots are exiting a cliff called the Jungfrau in Lauterbrunn in Switzerland. It's actually two different cliffs that this is filmed on. One for the actual exit where they jump and then two for where they're actually flying. And they're all doing this for real. This is all shot in camera. Base jumping is an acronym for building antenna span and earth. And when you incorporate wingsuit flying, which can also be done skydiving, with base jumping, it's called wingsuit base jumping. But this is taken to even another level, which is something called wingsuit proximity flying. So now, not only are they base jumping wingsuits, but they're then going to take those wingsuits and fly very close to terrain as a team. So this is probably the apex in what can be done in, in the jumping environment. This is hands down, the most dangerous wingsuit sequence that's ever been filmed, in my personal opinion. Wingsuit designs have been being developed and built for a very long time. Modern wingsuits didn't start getting developed with like ram air technology and using modern day zero porosity like nylon materials until the mid 90s. So since the mid 90s, up until now, it's literally every year developers are using wind tunnels and, and thousands of jumpers around the world to start like fine tuning what a wingsuit is capable of. So they keep getting better, stronger, faster, better glides and, and more flying characteristics each year. A lot of these shots, when you see them, they look like they're either on a green screen or they're not real, but they are real. They have a camera guy who's actually flying with a camera facing backwards. And they would actually face this camera in all these different directions in order to capture all of these different angles that you don't normally get to see. So the only things in here that you'll see that are CGI is they'll sometimes put a little cloud or maybe a, a, like a, a tree will go between camera and pilot. That's all. Originally, it was slated to have six jumps to capture all the angles they needed. All of a sudden, about three weeks into filming, I was asking one of the jumpers, like, you know, hey, how many jumps have you guys done? I've kind of lost count. And they're like, oh, we've done about 60 so far. And I'm like, you've done 60 jumps? I, I couldn't believe it was that many jumps that it was taking to capture all the angles they needed. So it, that gives you an idea of how complicated that scene was to film. This is, without a doubt, the closest any human being has ever flown to the ground for the longest period of time without making contact and without dying. This shot has always blown me away. It's, and in my opinion, it is the craziest shot I've ever seen put on camera because these men are moving at over 120 miles per hour in a very tight space without the ability to stop. How long you can stay in flight in a wingsuit depends on how high of altitude you're jumping from. So. This particular cliff is about 5,000 feet tall. It's basically a mile high. And this flight, particular flight, you can fly for around two and a half minutes. And if you count your canopy time, it can be up to three minutes. So this is actually a pretty realistic representation of how long the flight would be. It depends on what you're doing, but I always wear a helmet. I used to wear a helmet with goggles. Now I wear a helmet with a visor um, because I like to keep the air off my face and out of my eyes because we have a tendency to go so incredibly fast. If you were to actually impact the ground at those speeds, the helmet really probably won't help you very much. Now, you also have to have a helmet for when you're coming in for a landing under parachute. So you could have a landing where you kind of fall down and hit your head and then the helmet will be useful for that.
people ask like, you know, how do you turn a wingsuit? How do you control a wingsuit? And, I, and I'm always like, well, how do you walk, right? How do you explain walking to someone, right? It becomes second nature. What it takes to become a wingsuit pilot, you do all the, the thousands of skydives and you go through the training with the wingsuit. By the time you get to the level that you can control one properly, you just think it and you do it. Just like if you're a dancer dancing, right? You tell your body and it just kind of does it. Until you get that kind of muscle memory and your body becoming used to it, it's actually quite challenging. Over time, with practice, with training, like anything in your life, you know, you will get to a place where it becomes automatic for you. One of the main differences between skydiving and base jumping is in skydiving, you've got two parachutes. In base jumping, because we're jumping from so low, we're deploying even lower. There's no time to cut away and open a reserve. So on most base jumps, you are actually using a, a single parachute system. So that means if your main parachute doesn't work, it's over. And that's one of the reasons why the sport is so dangerous and why the scene was so dangerous. But having said that, when you've only got one shot, you take that shot very seriously. So the equipment is much simpler, it's, much, it's less likely to have malfunctions, and you treat it like you pack it like a reserve every time, so it's, it's literally perfection for every jump. You have something called a pilot chute, and that pilot chute sits underneath your container in something called a BOC, which means bottom of container. And, and that pilot chute, is attached to a bridle, uh, a piece of webbing that goes up to pins that keep the container closed. So as a wingsuit pilot's flying, when they decide to deploy, they fold their wings, reach back, grab that little pilot chute in the BOC, they yank it out and throw it into the wind. And as it catches air, it's a little tiny round parachute that creates drag that then pulls the bridle, pulls the pins, and then pulls the main canopy out. So it's basically the same process that we use on skydiving as well. It's just a little more advanced because you have to get around a wing. That's it. If you're doing a really dangerous jump that you know can potentially cause serious damage, what goes through your mind is very different than if you're doing a jump that's very safe by comparison. Wingsuit flying, I've noticed, is really scary as you're exiting, but once you exit, the sensation is that you have control and you feel almost it's impossible to describe. It, it is that dream you had as a child. You feel like you're flying. You feel like you have control. And it's very powerful. It's something that will draw you in over and over. I, I love it. I, it's a very wonderful sensation. The filming of this scene, even after all these years seeing it, it still hasn't been topped. Like this is still the greatest wingsuit flying sequence I've ever seen filmed. Next up, Iron Man 3. in the air. 13, sir. The reality is if you were to get sucked out of an aircraft at that altitude, you'd pass out almost instantly because you'd have no oxygen. So the first problem with that is the altitude that a, a commercial jetliner flies, let's just say 30,000 feet for the sake of argument, and then a normal skydiving plane without oxygen is around 12,000 feet. So there's, you know, there's quite a discrepancy there. See that guy? I'm gonna swing by you. Are you just gonna grab him? You got it? I'll electrify your arm. You won't be able to open your hand. I mean, Marvel, you know, obviously this is a comic book movie. It's not even meant to be even remotely real. But this idea of him putting electricity through her hand so it like seizes up so she won't let go, well, that's a great idea. But I'm sorry, a person's body weight will rip her fingers off. So it's not realistic, but you know, hey, they're trying to explain it. A person's weight doesn't change while falling, but their weight based on their surface area will change the speed at which they're falling. So let's just say you weigh 200 pounds and you have the surface area of a six foot four man spread out as wide as they can do, catching as much air as possible. You can probably slow that person down to maybe if they're wearing baggy clothes, like 100 miles an hour. Whereas if they get into like a tracking position where their arms and legs are together and their head down, you can get it to be over 200 miles an hour. I think the record's close to 300. So that's how this works. Actually, most of those people are my really good friends. And I remember when they were filming this, they were always calling it barrel of monkeys. But this is an actual real technical filming in the sky of people falling. At least that part's real. 
Remember that game called Barrel of Monkeys? That's what we're gonna do. 18,000 feet. Come on, people, everybody, grab your monkey. It's beautifully shot. Like, the, the them incorporating actual real footage of people in free fall and the CGI of Iron Man and the, them grabbing each other. It's really well done. It's stitched together in a way that suspension of disbelief is actually easy to have here. Formation skydiving is a massive thing and they actually break world records. I think the world record right now, I think it might be 400 people flying all at the same time, all connected in formation. So yes, it's a thing that's very big. A lot of people focus their entire skydiving careers on just formation skydiving. <laughs> If you're landing in water from a skydive with a parachute, it's actually quite nice. You know, it's not a problem. You land nice and soft. You have to be careful, like when some people like want to cut their canopies away when they hit, because you can get pulled under by it in current. So you just have to be careful that you're touching water when you cut away, because the depth perception of water when chopping a parachute, sometimes people, if they're not touching the water, they'll think they're closer than they are and they'll cut away too high. And then they'll get really badly hurt. What a lot of people don't realize is that water is as hard as concrete if you hit it at a high enough speed. So you'd have to slow someone down to a speed probably in like the 30, 40, maybe 50 mile per hour range in order for them to hit like gently enough to survive. Next up, last holiday. So are you ready? Yes, I am. Go get him, man! Damn. Going? We're rolling! Go ahead! Okay! It's funny because, you know, they're about to jump off of a dam in wingsuits, which is absolutely unrealistic. <laughs> I mean, th this thing can't be more than like 600 feet tall, which is too low for flying wingsuits for sure. They don't have dams that are high enough. You want to have at least minimum like a thousand feet to launch a wingsuit to get enough airspeed to move you far enough away to deploy a parachute safely. I have told you before, we have lost a couple of people doing this. What, like people died? Yeah. So, the, the, the fact that she's like surprised that people have died doing this is really quite funny. They're going on the assumption that she's never done a skydive, never done a base jump, and now she's doing a wingsuit base jump, which is so outside any realm whatsoever. And if she were to do this, she would 100% die. This is something where you need to be trained, like highly skilled trained to do this. So this is absolutely outside the realm of any kind of reality whatsoever. If a person wanted to get to the level of base jumping a wingsuit and they were starting from zero, meaning no skydives, you're looking at spending at least between five and 10 years of dedicating your life to it hundreds if not thousands of skydives, and then hundreds if not thousands of base jumps to be able to accomplish what she's about to do. All right. Three, okay. two, uh, uh. one, go! <laughs> What's really funny is that when they were doing the stunt, obviously the stunt man knew that this was absolutely unrealistic or unreasonable to do the jump in a wingsuit. So the wings are actually, you can see them cut off. So when he puts his arms up, the wings aren't actually attached. So he's actually doing a base jump, like a regular base jump with what looks like kind of a wingsuit, but it's not really a wingsuit. So they actually did a practical jump, obviously, but not with a real wingsuit. Perfect. I don't know why they put the wingsuit on. I think it was just kind of trying to show like, cause that must've been like a really like trendy thing at the time because they just did a regular base jump. She didn't actually fly. <laughs> they didn't even try to make it look like she was flying. They made her just do a base jump. So there was literally zero reason to even have a wingsuit on in the first place. So I don't know. That's just confusing. I'm confused. Let's, let's get caught up. Is that a problem? Uh, uh, yeah, I tell you, uh, there's a problem, uh, Klaus. I know a thing or two about base jumping. I know that the canopy is supposed to be connected to the rigging and it's not, and that's how people get killed. No wonder you've lost a few people. <laughs> so that's kind of funny because they're kind of showing that he's making up some reason for why his equipment is not proper so he can chicken out, which that's the only realistic thing in this whole scene. Anyone with a brain wouldn't be doing that, period. <laughs> like you, you would never do that. But the stupid excuse that he's making up, they obviously talk to real base jumpers because that would be if you're 
canopy wasn't attached to your rig, you wouldn't jump because yeah, you would die. So that's true. But honestly, if he had jumped even with the rig, he'd still die. There's no living in that scenario with someone who has no experience. Next up, Deadpool 2. I hate to interrupt, but is anybody nervous about the high winds? Gary. My name's Peter. I realize that you're new to this. I spent 10 years in Special Forces. You think we didn't jump out of the plane because of a light breeze? If you jump in really terrible wind, like how they're setting up this scene, it's going to go bad for you. <laughs> it's, it's not going to end well. And if you, have really, if you have wind as strong as what they're suggesting, then actually what, what's about to happen is probably pretty realistic because you have no control under canopy. And if you have no control under canopy, when you're coming into a city or urban environment with like, let's just say 40 or 50 mile an hour winds, well then it's going, everyone's going to get destroyed. Like it's gonna cause serious problems. The kind of normal guy with the mustache is just like, He's doing exactly what a person does when they're super terrified in their first skydive. They kind of like get in, they like sit down, like that's gonna somehow help them. They are getting closer to the ground before they go. It's actually really funny. Obviously this is all fake. None of this is real, it's all done green screen and CGI, but this is probably one of the better done CGI skydiving scenes I've seen, partially because it's just hilarious, but then because of the actual motions, like as you see the cameras coming in and the movements, they made it pretty real for being fake. Skydiving has all kinds of different positions for flying. There's two different disciplines that like primarily focus on that. One is called freestyle, and that's where you do all these special tricks. It looks almost like dancing in the sky. And then the other one more common and more frequently done these days is something called free flying. And free flying has, I mean, it's unlimited. The limits of where you can position your body and how you can fly your body is pretty much to your imagination. Um, they're not doing any of that in this scene. No one's doing any free flying. It's all pretty much tracking right now. They're just doing like this really specific tracking. But what's great about that scene is that he looks up and he just sees everyone's canopy is like tumbling in the sky. I've actually watched people open in winds that were so strong that it actually puts them sideways and it's flying them backwards. I mean, if you jump in strong enough wind, that kind of stuff can happen. And it, what that's showing is that they're all in absolutely horrifying wind that's unacceptable. They shouldn't have jumped. And that's the idea of this scene, I guess. There are square parachutes, elliptical parachutes, and round parachutes. So round parachutes have very limited um, forward motion, meaning they don't have much control. A square parachute has much more control in how you can fly and, and give you range and distance to land where you need to land. Elliptical parachutes are even faster and have even more range and can give you more distance. So the different shapes of parachutes dictate what type of landing you're trying to have. If you wanna have a high speed, like fast landing, you use elliptical. If you wanna have like a very precision landing, then you use a square parachute. If you wanna have just a, a round parachute that's just, you have a big open landing area without anything to hit, well then a round parachute will get you on the ground with very little input. Hitting power lines is probably the single most um, threatening thing you can have. If you hit power lines with a parachute, the possibility of you being electrocuted to death are very high. And unfortunately, it has happened in the past, but also what will happen sometimes is you'll hit the power line and because you're not grounded, you'll still be okay. And if that's the case, if you were to land in power lines and it doesn't actually fry you and you're hanging, you have to be really careful because if someone touches you, then they can become, they can ground you and then the power can come through the power line through you and through them and kill both of you. So yes, that is a thing. And yes, you don't ever wanna do that. You wanna avoid that by all costs, at all costs. Most skydiving is done at um, designated drop zones, like places that are designated for skydiving. It's very, very rare for skydivers to land anywhere near a city. Base jumpers have a tendency to land in cities more often because they have a tendency to jump off of buildings. And it's usually very highly skilled, professional, like highly professional jumpers who are precision that do that kind of stuff. Next up, along came Polly. I'm just gonna do a bit of a base jump. Here, 
Keep the walkie on channel 13, all right? I don't know what you're talking about. A base jump, a free fall from an inanimate object. Always carry me shoot in case I find a good launching point. It's actually kind of funny because in the background, he's like doing these stretches. Yeah, I, I don't usually do any sort of, sort of warm-ups when I'm getting ready to do a base jump of this nature. I go to the position and then I just jump off. There's some psychological stuff I'll sometimes do depending on how scary the jump is. But in general, you usually don't have time on jumps like this, if you're in a city and you're doing something that's eh, questionably the gray area legal, <laughs> like you're, then you don't have time for that. You get up, you go, and you just get you get off as quick as possible. And you can see that there's no parachute inside his container. It's literally a container with no parachute in. Like it's a, a person who doesn't like jump wouldn't notice that, but he has no parachute in there. You, I got your message, and you oh. know what? Let's just uh, start over. And forget about that whole Lufa oh, thing. Shit. No! Oh! Oh! Holy! I've always really loved this scene. I think it's 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 fun. It's really a funny one. And my friend Tim is the one who actually does this stunt. And they did it in the middle of downtown Los Angeles. I mean, with permits and permission and shutting down roads. It was incredible. I mean, it's done for real, so it's pretty cool. The storyline of Along Came Polly was supposed to be happening in New York, but the actual stunt was done in Los Angeles. And I believe the reason why is because New York is very strict about people jumping off of buildings, even for movies. Um, they just don't give permission for that kind of stuff, unfortunately. LA is actually quite open to giving permits and permissions to filmmakers to actually shoot stunts like this. People are jumping off skyscrapers every single day in every city in the world, period. People don't realize that, but if you look at a building that's high enough to jump off, it's being jumped off. <laughs> it's just happening on this planet, in every country, in every city, everywhere. But base jumpers are usually very quiet, they're super secretive, they do it in the dark, and you very rarely see it. I have jumped off hundreds of skyscrapers in probably 20 different countries. I mean, I jumped off the Eiffel Tower. I did a double reverse flip through the center of the Eiffel Tower, so that gives you a little idea. Whoa! Yeah! Whoa! Oh! Oh, crap! Obviously, the storyline is that he pulls so low that he doesn't even have time to like control it and he ends up hitting a tree. In real life, they actually landed on the road and then they put my buddy inside of a harness and then they drop him in a tree in order to make it look like he's gone into the tree. Tree landings are, are random. You never really know what you can get. So when you land in a tree, it can either be the softest, most gentle, nice landing you've ever had, or you can break branches that skewer you and you can bleed to death before anyone gets to you. So the, the goal is to avoid landing in trees because it's just kind of random what can happen. Now, in my career, I have probably 10 tree landings, and <laughs> that's not a good thing, that's a bad thing, but I've, I've had like 10 tree landings, and so far, all of them have been pretty gentle. I mean, they haven't been so bad, but I've had a few friends who it didn't go so well for. So, if you can avoid landing in trees, you do. Lyle Pfeffer, Lyle Pfeffer, you there, mate? Yes, Pfeffer, to Leland, hello? Come on down and give us a hand. I think I might have fractured me coccyx. Base jumpers usually will do that. Like they'll give a walkie talkie to someone else so that if anything goes wrong, they can communicate with them quickly to let them know something has gone wrong. So that's actually kind of a funny little like thing that he does to make it a little more, I guess, real. It's actually smart. But what's funny is him like on the walk, like saying, hey, come down. I might've broken my coccyx. I've actually landed in trees and called people and said, hey, I needed some help. I'm kind of, <laughs> I think I, I, think I, I, think I might've broken something. So it's actually funny because that actually has happened to me. Next up, Goldeneye. This is actually a really iconic scene. It's something that, you know, anyone who's watched this movie, this is something that you will always remember. This is actually done practically. They actually have a plane go over the edge and they have a man, he was actually a French base jumper. And at the time, he was the, the most advanced base jumper on the planet. I think he was the first base jumper to reach a thousand jumps of anyone in the world. And at the time, he's the one they hired to actually ride the motorcycle off. I think it was a cliff called the Hammer. So this part of the stunt where he's riding the motorcycle off the edge of the cliff is actually shot for real. Now this, you can tell, is obviously fake. You can see the background and him in this weird kind of body position, which is odd. And you can see that this is like some kind of, I don't even know what they're using, but it's like really bad green screen.
Even though I, I can tell that this isn't being done for real in this film, like this thing, people have done this for real. Just not from a motorcycle, like going off of a cliff. They've done where one airplane goes, drops, and then someone jumps out of another airplane and then gets into that airplane. That's actually been done quite a few times. And it's probably where this stunt got inspired. When you do it for real, when, a, when, a, when they make one airplane drop and another person gets out and gets into that airplane, they'll usually put a drogue chute on the back of the plane. So they have a cable with a little tiny parachute that will make the airplane fall at the same speed as the actual skydiver does. So it, there's certain things you'd have to do to the aircraft to prepare it to be able for that to happen. But recently, there were two Frenchmen, they jumped off of a cliff and had an airplane fly, and they were able to fly with the airplane and get into it without a drogue chute, without anything. So it can be done with a wingsuit. So with a wingsuit, you can actually get out up and get into an aircraft that's flying without droguing it. Without a wingsuit, you'll have to drogue the aircraft in order to fly at the same speed. I mean, it's classic James Bond, you know, doing like these big like tentpole stunts that you know, in this one I liked because it incorporated real, like the guy really riding a motorcycle off the cliff going into a real base jump as the plane is actually falling and having it all in the same shot. Really well done. The flying next to the airplane, they obviously had to do that with CGI and it was, you know, obviously fake. <laughs> you could tell it wasn't real, but I will say that that could be done in, in real life um, in different parts, in different pieces. Thank you so much for watching these clips with me. I hope you enjoyed yourself. I'll see you next time.